please be seated. So I haven't forgotten to read you the gospel, but instead I thought I'd like you to reflect on each section of the gospel as it's presented today. Today's story is most affectionately known as the prodigal son, a title that can be problematic, at least for me, but let's not jump ahead. So I thought I would um, break this up a little bit. Now, why am I doing this? Now, sometimes, and I'm sure that you will agree with me, sometimes when a story is really well known, like really well known, so as soon as I mention the title, The Prodigal Son, we sort of tune out a little bit. Our brains are very clever. Our brains are very clever. And when we don't need to listen intently, they don't. They'll go off and make a shopping list or decide what we're having for dinner or think about our cup of coffee in a little while. So to listen intentionally, I thought I'd break the story up a little bit. One of the first issues for me with this, this story, this parable, this connection to God in this way, is the title, The Prodigal Son. The story is not just about the son who took off with all his family's property and then came back when he had nothing left. The story is placed inside Luke's gospel and it talks about lostness rather than prodigalness, which is, I think, a word I made up, but anyway. But it talks about lostness. The story of the lost son comes right after the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. But this story is not only about one lost son, as the title sort of intimates. Anyone who's ever identified as the older son in the story would recognise his lostness also. But lastly, the thing that rubs me the wrong way the most is the term prodigal. The definition of the word prodigal, particularly contextually within this particular story, is, is defined as reckless, wanton, extravagant and wasteful. Wanton, reckless, extravagant and wasteful. And it's attributed to the younger son because his actions devour the family property, take what is his, essentially, before it's his time to have it. But the term could also be attributed to the father. He is reckless, wanton, extravagant and wasteful with his affection and unconditional forgiveness, the forgiveness of his wayward son. But he is also this way with his devoted son, even as his devoted son cannot or will not see it. If the father in the story is indeed God, then the whole tone of the reading changes and the title, the prodigal God, would be more appropriate. The prodigal God defines who the sons are and how they behave, as well as answering the so what question that I just love, that asks, well, so what? What does it mean for us? What does it mean that the prodigal God informs us, teaches us about family life, both within our homes and within our churches? What can the story show us? So before I start with the reading of the gospel, I've got a couple of questions to help with your own reflecting. So who are you? A nice easy question. Who are you? Not just your name, but who are you? And to whom do you belong? So most of us would identify as belonging to someone, or a couple of someones, or a few someones. Who is God for you though? How are you connected to God? Who are you to God? So not who is God to you, but who are you to God? What is it that God sees that no one else does? To help the disciples answer these questions, inadvertently, you know, Jesus isn't that kind of black and white, he told stories like this story. Jesus tells us the story as well. 
that God is love and no matter what we do or say, there is nothing that changes that love. God's love is offered freely, wantonly, extravagantly, given without reserve or cost, even as we recognise our own inability to receive it. We're like the brothers who are too self-centred, but God still loves us and still wants to love us. So firstly, put yourself in the place of the younger son. Hear it from his perspective. So all of you are now younger sons or daughters. You're the youngest. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and travelled to a distant country, and there he squandered his property in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his feed, fields to feed the pigs. And he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. And no one gave him anything. Have you ever been selfish or self-centred? I know that for myself there have been times where I, all I could ever think about were my own needs, my own desires, and I either wasn't aware of what I was doing or flat out refused to see another's perspective or point of view. I was not interested in seeing that which differed from my opinion, my world view. I remember thinking things like, it's my life, so it's my choice, right? The argument is what some of us are using to not be vaccinated, and it's fine. My life, my choice. I'm in control of my life, and so it's always my decision, which is fine when it only affects us. And it might even be considered self-centred when it's about more than us. The younger son in the story is not thinking about the ramifications of his decision on his family when he asks for his share of the property. He's not thinking about his father or his elder brother and how they'll manage with a third less than they had before. He doesn't care that his family name or status will be ruined, that his father's status and standing within community is all but shot. He doesn't care that his father, in particular, will be shamed. Because essentially, he's wishing his dad dead by asking for the property. No, the younger son is concerned about what he's entitled to, and he wants it now. He's in an all-fire hurry to go and live his life as he sees fit. His life, his choice. No living under the rules anymore. No doing as his father or brother bids. He's ready to go, what he want, go where he wants, do what he wants. By asking for his share, he declares that it's his life, his choice. But later, all the money's gone. I wonder how long it took. No one wants to know him anymore. His selfish desires haven't got him very far. He's got no new friends, no better position in life. In fact, if anything, he's worse off than ever before. He becomes so desperate that he thinks he could even eat the pig food, which for a Jewish man is an abomination. You may as well be dead. There's no coming back from eating the pig food. But it's not even offered. His self-centeredness has ostracised him, has made him less than human. He has nothing and no one. Next bit. We listen from a slightly different perspective. So you're still the younger son, but you're going to temper that with also listening from the father's perspective. 
watching for your wayward child. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. God has given us free will to choose. Sometimes we fall into the pit and make wrong decisions and choices. Sometimes we abuse that freedom to choose. And sometimes we choose that which is not only bad for us, but could be considered bad for others. But even in the midst of these bad decisions, God does not abandon us if we return repent we are forgiven I hear you say yep we've always got to do something haven't we to be forgiven return repent you can't see the sun if you walk away from it you can feel its effects you can see the light but if you want to see the sun you've got to turn around Like the father in the story, God waits and watches for us to return. Bad choices can always be changed or fixed. Not undone, but forgiven. God actually wants us to return. Waits for us, longingly, expectantly to turn back, to fall into God's loving embrace. And just like the father in the story, God does not condemn us or flaunt our past wrongs, or throw our bad decisions back into our face. God is only pleased that we accept the embrace offered. The most difficult thing for us to do or to cope with is pride. Pride keeps us stuck, stuck in our bad decisions, even when we realise they're wrong, even when we know for sure they're wrong. Pride sometimes means we keep making the same bad decisions over and over and over and over. By far the most difficult thing for us to do is to admit that we were wrong in the first place and turn back. But God doesn't want us to hurt from our past wrongs. God just wants to offer us comfort and compassion and forgiveness, wantonly, extravagantly, to help us learn from our mistakes so that we don't feel compelled to turn away again. We listen to the Father and how he responds. Then the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. The first step back is never easy. In fact, the first one is usually the most difficult. It's hard to humble ourselves and admit that we're wrong, even if only to ourselves. It's hard to ask for forgiveness, sometimes harder to accept it. But God only cares that we take the step. Just like with the returning son, there are no recriminations from the father. No, well, what have you done with my money? Or where have you been? There's not, nothing like that. No recriminations. There's simply absolute joy that we've returned and allowed ourselves to be wrapped up in God's embrace. 
to feel the love and acceptance. What is past is past. The choices of the past are forgotten, as if they never existed, blotted out. God only cares about the choice we made to return. As in the story, the Father returns to us our possessions, as if they'd never been removed in the first place. The son's sins are not simply forgiven him, but blotted out of the book of wrongs, never to be thought of again, well, at least by the father. We are offered this same redemption through Jesus' passion and death and resurrection. We do not have to pay for our mistakes again and again and again. They've already been paid for, as if they never occurred in the first place, by the son. Just as our joy is in God, so God's joy is in us. But we don't see our own worth. Surely we're not worthy of God's joy. The last section introduces us to the elder son's perspective. And we've all been that elder child, even if you don't admit it to even yourself. We've all been that elder child, the good child the one who always does what is asked of us, the one who always responds in the most appropriate way, the way that's expected. Let's listen from that perspective. Now, his elder son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called out to the slaves and asked, what is going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, listen, for all these years I've been working like a slave for you and I've never disobeyed your command yet you've never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fatted calf for him? Burning hot resentment and a sense of injustice is the elder son's lot. It sits like bile in his throat, ready to choke him. I'm sure we can all resonate with this sense of unfairness. I know I can. How can this son who squandered the family's wealth, wished the father dead, be allowed to return with no repercussions, no consequences? That's not fair. That is so unfair. How is he allowed to return to his former status? As if nothing has occurred. Does he get another share of the property now? This is unforgivable from the elder son's perspective. He cannot release the resentment from his heart and be glad that his brother who was dead, dead to them, is actually not. All he can see is a lack of injustice, the lack of justice for himself, his own resentment. And here's the rub for us. The elder son is also so far from the father and what the father wants for his kids as to not even be in the same code, district, planet. The elder son is showing that he is just as self-centred as the younger, more so. The younger son was selfish and distant from God because he was bad and disobedient. But the elder son was selfish and distant from God because he was good and obedient. Which is the worst sin? The elder brother is motivated by his own worth and sense of entitlement, just as the younger. His sense of right, of self-sacrifice, 
cause his jealousy to burn inside him, burn into hate, vitriol. These hateful feelings will never let him be loved by the Father either. What sadness for him, for God, that his heart is closed, dark, sour. This one is actually harder to swallow for us. It's harder to admit that truth in us of it. It's not lost on us that more often than not, this is the one, this is the one feeling that resonates most deeply, even if it's only briefly. But just like in the story, God stands patiently waiting and watching for us to return, comes out to meet us. Come, come back to me. Whatever has gone before, God is ready with open arms and a warm embrace. We are promised that no one is beyond God's forgiveness and love, not even us. We're not that important. <laughs> and we are infinitely, pricelessly important to God. So whether our distance is because of the sin of greed and selfishness or the sin of resentment and bitterness, when we finally realise that we cannot do any of it without God, God is already there, waiting for us to return, moving forward to embrace us, coming to meet us already there. And the only step we need to take is the first one, the choice to step. God is waiting to bejewel us, to clothe us, to love us, to rejoice in us. Us that are lost, now we're found. Us that are dead, now we're alive. Like for the son who finally came to his senses and turned for home, or for the son who refused to turn for home, Father, the Father always comes out to bring us in. Father welcomes all his children to his family through his son. Remember that hymn? Father welcomes all his children to his family through his son. So that, take that home in your reflection this week. The father said to him, son, you are always with me and what is mine is yours. We had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and he's come to life. He was lost and now he's been found. No matter if you're younger or elder children or a bit of both, even at the same time, God is still willing, waiting, wanting you to come home, begging you to come home. All we have to do is take the first step. The first step. Maybe it's time for you to step. The Lord be with you.